Welcome to Tuesday night with County Executive Pittman. Uh, I have a, um, a group of people with me tonight who um, are very brave to be here. This is gonna be uh, at times difficult. Our topic is the COVID impact. And uh, we're gonna do something that I don't think has been done enough during this pandemic, which is to hear directly from people who have either suffered from uh, COVID themselves and, and are here to tell, tell their stories, um, as well as people who have lost family members from COVID, as well as people who work in our hospitals, um, health professionals who are working with victims of COVID. So uh, I don't need to explain to anybody where we are. Uh, everybody hears in the news uh, that fall um, has brought on a surge and our numbers are higher than they have ever been. Um, fortunately, the hospitals have more, more knowledge and information and, and, and um, medications for treatment, but uh, we are still losing uh, in this country um, over a thousand people, uh, well over a thousand people every single day and to this disease. Um, and in Maryland, um, we are losing in the range of 20 every day. And in Anne Arundel County, we've been losing about one a day uh, recently. Um, but more concerning than that is that the numbers are just starting to really spike in the state and the county, as well as in the country. And we know that that means more hospitalizations coming um, and more serious illness in the coming, coming and unfortunately um, losing more of our neighbors and our, and our loved ones. Uh, so, um, we all know that we have to treat this virus seriously and that um, I, I, I can't say enough, nobody can say enough how important it is to um, maintain distance, wear masks, follow all the, all the, the guidelines, but even more than that, um, to act like everybody around you is infected and you're infected, except for the people that you are living with and you are close to all of the time, um, to stop the spread, because um, we we know how to do that and we must do that. So I wanna thank, I wanna to thank Tamika Smith in, in our office. Um, she's in constituent service, community engagement, constituent service. And you know, in every organization you have the people who, who say, um, let's just get this done. We talked about doing this um, well over a month ago and um, had lots of other things going on. And a couple of weeks ago, she said, um, we need to do this. Let's just do it. So she pulled this together. Um, many of you contacted us because you wanted to tell stories and she reached out to others to, to bring you together and put all this together. So thank you, Tamika. Um, we are going to run through one at a time. Um, everybody on this list, I'm not gonna introduce you all at the beginning. We're gonna go, we're gonna go one at a time. And, and um, here first um, from a young man named uh, Tevan Eads, whose father is well known, was well known, is still well known and well remembered in the city of Annapolis, particularly um, uh, his name was Robert Eads and um, the community lost, lost him to this pandemic. <clears throat> and I wanna, I want to start out with uh, a video that we put together interviewing Tavon, and then he'll he'll speak to you directly after after the video. So can we let this roll? The hardest part about COVID was losing my dad, and for the simple fact that I had to be the one to take him off the ventilator. He called me. July 13th and told me that, you know, he had caught COVID so I couldn't come see him. And in turn, I got a text July the 16th that said he was back in the hospital and, and you know, he wasn't, he wasn't feeling too well. And I, and I just told him, I said, man, this, this, you're going to get through it. You're going to fight. You're strong. You, you taught me to be strong. You taught me to be a soldier. You a soldier. And his words was, I don't think I'm going to come home. So come July 20th, I text Max I'm feeling, he said, I'm not feeling too good. And I was like, you know, I told him, you know, how I, I said, you can be all right and I love you. He texts you, say, I love you, number one. That's the last text I got was J July 20th. A week after that, they say he was slowly getting better. 
But in the course of 24 hours, he had took a turn for the worse. And, but I want people to know that him taking a turn for the worse, he had every underlying issue. It, it, he, had, he had heart problem issues. He had asthma. He had um, kidney issues because of his diabetes. So he had every underlying issue to know that he possibly couldn't make it home. August 2nd, they, you know, they was, they was telling me, you know, well, it's not looking good, it's not looking good. They had, they had put him on a ventilator. He had been on it for about two, almost two weeks, a week and a half, two weeks. And it was at the point of, um, they said we were about to start giving him dialysis. But his wish was, if he was on a ventilator, he didn't want to be on no more than 14 days to 30 days. And if they had the point of with dialysis, let him go. So that's when I reached out to my, uh, his fiance, my sisters, my brothers, and told them that this is what's going on. So the hardest thing I could say out of this was watching him take his last breath. Me and my, um, one of my little brothers actually watched, my, watched him take his last breath. And that's just the hardest part I still live with to this day. What gives me hope? Prayer. Prayer, family, stick together. Prayer, I, just, I pray every day. Wow. Well, thank thank you for that, Tavon. And and um, I was saying before the show started that that I first met your dad when I was campaigning for this office. He was at Forty Nine West, and I still have his business card, um, his taxi business card. Um, but uh, not many people more loved than him in Annapolis. Um, what can you add to that? Uh, I mean, when I when I say like it, what people don't realize is that. Even with him passing unexpectedly due to COVID, we already had a tough time in our family because he had lost a brother and sister uh, six months before, and then he had lost another brother 30 days after he had passed. So, and my uncle was on the uncle that I passed after my dad. He was he had been on hospice since February, so we our family was going through a tough time anyway. And you know, I used to tell my dad, "Hey, stick in the house, stay in the house." Uh, I help where it need be, help where it need be. Man, one thing he said, he said, I'm I'm the man of my family, so I gotta I gotta get back out there. And what he did when he was going back out there, he was helping other families, make sure they got food for the for the elders that couldn't come out. He made sure they got boxes of food. He was help transport boxes of food. He still was he started working a little bit and he was um actually helping people getting to and from. So and and, and I don't know how he caught COVID, but he caught it, but he was very conscious in his efforts and everything about COVID. He used to always call me every morning before I went out to work because I've, I've actually been working through COVID the whole time. You know, he said, you got your mask on, you got your gloves, you got your hand sanitizer, you got everything you need every day. He called me every day. He, he stayed in my head because he knows me. When I, I get to work and then I work, I, I, I get I get to, sometimes I become forgetful, but he stayed on me every day to make sure that I had everything that I needed to protect myself, to protect my, my youngest daughter who, who lives with me as well, so she wouldn't catch it. Um, but like I said, it devastated a family, but I, I see it devastated a city and a, and a county more than more than me because at the end of the day, I still see what effect that he had on everybody else. Even though he was vocal in Annapolis and in the, as, as most people say, in the black community, he still was a humanitarian. He spoke on what he could speak on, and he spoke on what he felt was right, and he always did in a respectful manner and in a positive manner. But it, I, it, it, this, it, 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 it was just a matter of time before he came after me, because I was a county executive, and he, he, he knew how, when he had something he was after for the community, he, he would... Yeah. He would uh, he would come after it, and and I do remember that at the end he was really working hard to educate people about COVID, um, especially in the African American community in Annapolis, where the numbers were, were um, yes. and still are higher higher than uh, than the community at large. So and, and he was he was going out handing out PPE to everyone, anyone and everyone. He was going out handing out PPE as well as meals. So he he did have a conscious effort in COVID, and he was doing his part that he felt was his part as a humanitarian to help 
prevent other people from catching COVID. And unfortunately, you know, he, he became one of the persons that uh actually surprisingly caught it and passed away from it. Yeah. But like I told you, like, to, to this day, and I still say it, he had every underlying issue. And he he wore his PPE, he wore his face mask, he had hand sanitizer, he did everything he needed to do, but it was I guess the way it happened and the chips fell, it was unpreventable. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing his story. And I know you're gonna carry on his work and, and keep that story sure. alive. So so thank you. Yes, and, and thank uh, you. Keep on praying, man. <laughs> That's um, all we'll through. You're right about that. That's all we can do. Um, so, um, we're going to go through each person on this, on this group, and then, um, we may have time for a little bit of conversation among us at the end, which would be nice as well as, as hearing from others. Um, so let me jump on, um, to, uh, Melonia Hawkins and, uh, Melonia is a nurse and, um, and you, uh, you have experienced COVID yourself. Is that right, Melonia? Yes, sir. I have. Yes. Tell, tell us what's that, what that's like. Hmm. Um, so I contracted COVID early April. I wasn't aware that I had it. I thought it was just, you know, something, you know, I had come down with a cold or something because I did not, I never ran a fever. And at that point in time, we were really associating COVID with that being one of the first things or one of the underlying um, signs and symptoms was the spike temperature, which I never ran. I left work for a couple of days. I re recuperated actually, and I felt fine for about four days. And one day I was driving home from work and it just fell, fell on me. Like when I say in approximately an hour, cause it took me an hour to drive from work to home in approximately an hour, I went from zero to a hundred. I barely made it in my front door. Um, I almost collapsed. I called my doctor immediately and being, being a nurse in my facility at that time, we had no positive cases. However, I am a, a in-state traveling nurse and I would go as the frontline workers when workers were out. So I took direct, I was direct care with those COVID residents and COVID patients and different facilities. And so I knew I was like, oh my God, I have, I, I, I have COVID. I must have COVID. I ended up in the hospital. Um, the one thing I can say is, um, Later on, I found out that I didn't even get COVID from work. I actually got it from my son who brought it home from college. He was away in college, came home on spring break. At that point in time, the um, patient first, first and the right times, they were not giving the COVID test because we just did not have enough. We didn't have enough and they were still trying to figure things out and everything was still brand new. So he never got tested. They sent him back home and we found out later that it was COVID that he had. So that's the way that I actually contracted COVID. Um, because after I looked at the timeline, I had not went into a facility until after he was already home. So that's the way I contracted COVID. Um, all I can remember is leaving home to go to the hospital. My mom took me, my husband, who is actually one of your um, Anne Arundel County um, employees of 13 years. He works, um, he's one of the um, acting supervisors in the Odenton County yard for the roads. And I had to leave home and I left him saying, reminding him how much I loved him and where our insurance policy was. Mm -hmm. That how bad I felt. I just knew in my heart I was gonna die. I thought I was gonna leave home and never return. Mm -hmm. I suffered with COVID. Um, it lasted for about 27 days before I was able to recoup and go back to work. I am still today, it's November the 17th and I, um, still have airspace lung disease and i'm also suffering with some liver damage and all a resort of covid wow so um you could well have gotten it in your work but it just happened to be that you got it from your son yes oh. yes and are you back at work i am i am back at, as soon as i could get back to work i went back to work what i noticed is is that, um, and especially with nurses, uh, this, this virus is so devastating. It's, it's mentally challenging. I knew that I was still needed. And the same way that those nurses and those doctors took care of me at that hospital, I knew that people needed me. 
I knew that loved ones couldn't be with their families. My mom had to drop me off. And the way I had to walk through tents just to get into the hospital, I'm like, I do this on a daily basis and I've never had to experience this for myself. And just the the way that I had to leave my family, I have five children, I have a granddaughter, my husband and my mom, of course. Um, and just the way that I had to leave home, not knowing if I would return, the comfort that they gave me at that hospital, it was just so, I was so grateful. So I knew that as soon as I could get back on the front line, I needed to get there because I needed to be that person. I needed to be the one to hold hands of people dying. I needed to be the one to, you know, comfort the family members. In the same way that those nurses and doctors took care of me, I knew that I needed to, be. if God spared my life, I promised God that if he spared my life, I will go back and I will give back to the individuals, This I give back the same way that those individuals gave to me. So I'm wow. definitely out there and I'm still, and now I'm an infection prevention specialist. So I take care of all of the COVID. I monitor CDC and CMS every day, all day. So yeah, yes, I'm back on the front line. Yeah. They they say the nurses and doctors are heroes and now, now we know it's true. Uh, thank you for being a hero and, and, and for your service. Thank you uh, so much. And it, yeah, um, wow. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and all of your peers. Um, all right, let's jump on. Um, I, I feel like I should be spending about an hour with each of you talking about this, but I'm watching this clock here and it's telling me that I shouldn't do that. So um, um, you all deserve uh, a whole lot of time and, and um, you're already making me feel like a better person or making me wanna be a better person just listening to you. Um, so we have uh, Christine and Jennifer who are going to talk to us about um, losing their father to COVID. Um, welcome, thank you for doing Hi, this. Thank you. thank you for having us. We, um, we lost our dad September 2nd. Um, he, he battled with COVID um, at Baltimore, Washington. Um, for 36 days and um, he he was a vibrant 76 year old man who never had a day in the hospital. Um, you know, looking forward to retirement, had just moved here from Westminster to be closer to his daughters and his grandkids. And um, he, he was ventilated within one hour of being brought into the emergency room. Um, he, had two telehealth appointments with his doctor prior to, um, you know, to, to being taken to the hospital via ambulance. Um, a lot of Tavon's story um, just resonated with my sister and myself. We shook our heads at each other a lot when we listened to him. And um, we unfortunately didn't have the experience of being able to even say to my dad, you know, um, you'll get through this you know, because we didn't know he was sick because that's the kind of man he was, you know, he's like, yeah, you know, ah, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know, but he was only sick with COVID six days before, um, you know, he was taken by ambulance and, and in a joining ambulance, my mother was taken as well. So we got a phone call we actually got a text message that said, dad and I are in separate ambulances. We're headed to the hospital. We both have COVID. Um, and we were just like, what, what, what? And, you know, with an hour of getting to the hospital, my dad was intubated. He was put in a drug induced coma and he never woke up. And 36 days later, um, he, he suffered everything that you hear, um, the horror stories, you know, it's, it's not a conspiracy. It's not made up. It's it's the real deal. He um, he had pulmonary embolisms in both lungs. He had COVID pneumonia on top of a secondary pneumonia. Um, he needed to be proned nine times. And for our hospital staff that's here tonight, they understand what that means for the work that it puts on the hospital staff and the and you know what the patient endures by being proned and. Um, 
He then had embolisms in both lungs, which required heparin. Um, the heparin, because of him having intubation for a prolonged period of time, he had you know, wounds down his throat. Um, he began to bleed out from his tracheostomy tube. Um, it was, it was horrific. And, um, we too, you know, as a family could only talk to my dad through a tablet. Um, we were grateful that the hospital was doing everything they could do to keep us connected to him. Um, but at the same time, we saw this vibrant man who was the rock of our family um, battling this alone. Um, you know, thank God for the nursing staff. Thank God for his doctors. Um, they're amazing. Um, we'll forever be just grateful to them for the kindness that they showed to our family and, and the care that they gave to my dad. Um, you know, but it's, we're never going to be the same. You know, we, we never got to actually look at him and hold his hand and have him look at us and say, you know, we love you. You've been everything to us. And he never got to ever say goodbye to any of the people that he loved for his lifetime. There was, you know, he was up and vibrant and living his life. And six days later, he was intubated in a coma and 36 day or late, days later, he was gone. And COVID just ravaged his body. And, and I just want to add that he actually was a healthy man, not a healthy 76 year old. So he didn't have, you know, all those underlying conditions that people talk about like, that, you know, you only get COVID if you're, you know, uh, have underlying conditions or this or that. He, you know, he, you know, he was a healthy 76 year old man looking forward to retirement. He was a teacher. He was an entrepreneur. He worked, um, in uh, with uh, adjudicated youth um, in the Hickey system in Florence Bertel Academy. Um, he was an amazing um, um, uh, dad and grandfather and mentor to a lot of young men. Um, I just, I really just want people to take this seriously. This is not, you know, a hoax. It's not a conspiracy. This is real. And we can do our part as individuals to wear masks and, and socially distance and limit the crowds to your little you know, network, your little bubble of people that you know where they've been. Um, I understand this is difficult in businesses and we have to balance that. Um, but I would encourage people. I mean, we don't even, we don't know how um, he got COVID. Um, he had just moved to Croft into a 55 and over uh, place. Um, we're guessing because they were having some work done on their kitchen. They were eating, you know, in restaurants during that time in July. It was like right after the surge of July 4th is when he got sick. Um, so I mean, we just want people to be cautious and be safe and, and, um, and be, be responsible this holiday season. Take care of each other. Take care of our community. Yeah. And thank you for all of your hard work in trying to <laughs> protect us as best as possible. We appreciate you very much. You know, thank you. Uh, thank you, my dad's team at UMD Baltimore, Washington, his doctors, nurses, PAs, everyone that took care of him day and night, and also the paramedics that took him to the ER in July. Bye. And thank you, County Executive. Well, thank you for sharing that story because I know um, as I listen to this, I put myself in the shoes of the people who, who might be listening and, and uh, understand that this is a real pandemic, but have decisions to make in the next week, two weeks, months about what they're going to do, where they're going to go, who they're going to, who they're going to interact with. And um, I, I truly believe that, that these stories are going to help people to make the right decisions. So thank you. Um, so next we have. Um, thank you. Yeah. Next, we have Brian Holtzlander, who is um, an Anne Arundel County firefighter uh, who I've gotten to know through the union. He's a union member, leader, and, and um, I actually didn't know that uh, you were sick with COVID, Brian. At first, I wasn't following my social media feed very closely, and, and then I was... Um, 
I was shocked to hear that that uh, after doing all the work that you've been doing, um, bringing people to the hospital in the ambulance and taking care of everybody that uh, even you, a strong firefighter, um, was struggling with this disease. So um, tell us what that was like, Brian. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. And um, I just want to say also just, uh, you know, uh, what a privilege it is to be here um, with everything on uh, the Zoom and then, of course, our, our citizens. Um, yeah, listening to these stories, I can tell you, like, um, one of the privileges of being a firefighter is that uh, every day I go to work, it's something different and, and someone different. And, uh, you know, I go into houses and in the biggest mansions and to the, um, you know, places where people, uh, you know, are struggling. And the stories that you're hearing today, it's the story of our community. Um, it has touched so many different people um, in, in so many different ways. Um, and um, it's, it's just humbling to be here and hear everyone else's story too. And, and um, like I said, I'm, um, it's a uh, privilege to share mine. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Brian I'm with the fire department. Um, just share a little bit about our experience for the last eight months on the front lines. And then a little bit um, about my personal experience with uh, being part of uh, an outbreak in a long-term care facility where I also serve as a nurse and um, and going through the, the the virus and then and then my recovery um, I, I said I have a lot to be thankful for um, and uh, just to say also how proud I am of my fellow uh, healthcare workers and of the citizens um, I know the sacrifices that everyone in the community has made over the last eight months um, and it continues to be a, a privilege to be part of the animal community um, first it's our number one priority to, to keep people safe I mean we take an oath uh, as firefighters and paramedics, and we all take that seriously. Um, and when people ask me, what has COVID been like? I tell them it makes everything harder and take longer. <laughs> um, you've heard about, you know, people being alone and the PPE required to, to be around each other with this disease. And, um, you know, it's the same when we're out, uh, you know, running calls and emergencies. Um, you know, you have to essentially put on a hazmat suit every time you go into one of these, one of the houses um and it's hot and it's uncomfortable and it's really difficult to do the advanced procedures that we're required to do like intubations and starting ivs um but it's it's the necessity of the moment um and yeah we've seen a lot of a lot of sick patients and we've just seen a lot of patients um right now it's 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 like deja vu um the hospital wait times are getting longer um, it's not uncommon for us to spend hours in the parking lot waiting in our ambulance with a sick patient for a room in the ER because there's no beds. Um, and that's now, and we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And, um, you know, we just have to start doing the right things or, um, you know, the system that we have, which we're so, uh, you know, so uh, thankful to have here, here in Anne Arundel and here in Maryland, which is a great system. Um, you know, we'll just hit our capacity. Um, you know, and those are, those are the risks that, you know, you, that you take and, um, you know, and that's our, our firefighters and then that's just the duty that we have. Um, and we're, uh, we're proud to do it. Um, but there's also the risk that you can get it and you can take it home. And, you know, that's, that's what happened to me. Um, like I said, I have a lot to be thankful for. I was pretty sick and I was able to avoid um, hospitalization, uh, but my virus went the distance um, two weeks. Um, biggest problem for me um, after the initial respiratory issue was just 10, 11 days of debilitating fevers that would run eight, nine hours a night and push everything out of your body. Um, and then it let go of you around six, seven in the morning. <clears throat> you kind of pull yourself together and try to rehydrate and get your kidneys in order to do it again the next night. And it just would pound away at you. And, and um, like I said, I'd like to think I'm a pretty tough, healthy guy, but um, it, was a, it was a humbling experience um, for that alone, uh, let alone the fact that um, it's a heck of a thing to, in a moment uh, when you're feeling healthy, to get a phone call and tell you you're positive and you immediately become, you know, a danger to the people that you care about most. And that was my wife and daughter. Uh, they were way at 
away from the house at the time I got the call and uh, you know, I had to tell them not to come home. And uh, we had some family out of state that they could go and stay with. And uh, you know, I just buckled down for the next two, three weeks. And like you've heard here, you're just alone. You know, you know, people call you and check on you and, and you, you live for those moments. But if, if you're trying to do the right thing, you're going to, you're going to be utterly alone for the duration. And it's one thing on you, but you know, I can only imagine it was like for my wife and daughter who probably wanted nothing more than to, um, to be there with me. And, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was hard to, you know, watch them go through that too. Um, but, you know, like I said, those are the risks that you take and that's part of the, you know, the shared sacrifice that, you know, we all have with one another, not just firefighters, first responders and their families, but, you know, our community members too. And um, the truth is, we, you know, we can't do it ourselves. I mentioned about the nurses and the hospitals and we can do everything right. Um, but if we don't have the participation of the everyday citizen um, making good decisions about, you know, hand hygiene, um, you know, wearing a mask and just making good sound decisions about their interactions with people. Um, it's going to be a losing battle. Um, and, you know, that being said, I'm still confident. I've seen incredible heroism from everyday people in their homes, taking care of sick loved ones and just with nothing more than hoping for the best. And, um, you know, that's our community. And, and again, that's what I'm, I'm so proud to get up in every day and go to work for. And, um, and we'll continue doing it. You know, our firefighters will be there tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. And like I said, uh, you know, you can rely on us. And, you know, I hope in this time we can rely on you too, just to make good decisions and, and you know, we'll be there for each other. Wow. And if you if you if you don't know Brian and you haven't met him, he's about as as healthy and fit, at least looking, <laughs> as they come. Uh, exactly the you know the kind of person who probably thinks um, uh, they're way too strong to to have this thing really take them down. So um, um, that sounds uh, um, like it really hits you hard and and. Um, I, for one, and many other people are very uh, gratified that you pulled through and that you're back with us because we need you. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so we, we're we really lucky tonight. We have with us um, both Lieutenant Stephen Thomas and Jen Corbin, who um, they're sort of folk heroes uh, in Anne Arundel County in that um, they do our crisis intervention teams and uh, Lieutenant Thomas from the police department, um, Jen Corbin, mental health, they work together hand in hand. The team works together hand in hand. In fact, they won the award, uh, global award um, for um, as the best crisis intervention operation in the world this year. And Lieutenant Thomas himself has won awards for his work and, and um, um, I, I feel like sometimes he's the heart and the soul of, of the police department, uh, always there for the most difficult moments. Um, and uh, also, uh, also Lieutenant Thomas experienced COVID. So um, I know the two of you are together on screen. Uh, do this however you like, if you wanna do a back and forth or, or, you, or you can go first, okay. Lieutenant. So um, Jen and I are always together and uh, <laughs> So the, um, on Sunday night, March 22nd, I was home with my wife and exercised, felt great. Um, the morning got up, did 20 minutes of cardio, had great time, felt sensational. Came in to work, worked through the day, um, left, I guess, about 4.30, and as I was leaving, I just started feeling chills. And as Ms. Hawkins said, it just hit you, it just hit me. Um, drove home, went in and told my wife, hey, I don't feel too good. She took my temperature and I had a fever of 103. Um, I immediately texted Jen and said, call me and let her know that I had a fever and I was gonna be quarantined and was out of service. Um, I was home sick for 10 days, 
with all the typical symptoms of the fever up and down. Um, actually, I even was opening windows at night because I get so hot. Um, I had the diarrhea. I wasn't eating. Um, I actually lost throughout the course of it, 25 pounds in 17 days. Um, the worst, and this is the, probably the biggest mistake I made was not going to the hospital that first weekend. Um, I had agonizing headache. So you figure that was about seven days out. Um, so I was taking medication for the headache, taking um, ibuprofen um, for the fever, but just continually felt worse and worse. Um, so it was on that following Wednesday after 10 days, actually I felt like I was gagging on phlegm and told my wife, I need to go to the hospital. Um, and I know it was tough on my family the whole time because they were taking care of me. Um, my, I have three adults, well, I say adult children, but two of them were seniors in college who were now home finishing their senior year virtually. My son was a freshman um, at Robert Morris University, home from Pittsburgh. So everyone was home. The Wi-Fi was tough. And it sounds like it's a first world problem. But when you have two girls that are trying to finish their college, one of them, dissertation got canceled. Well, she had to do it virtually. She had to, um, wasn't able to do what her dream was for her experiment that she had prepared for for a while. So it's really tough as a father with that, knowing that you weren't there to support your family and you're dependent on them to take care of you. So that Wednesday night, um, my wife took me and basically um, she had to drop me off at the door at BWMC in the emergency room because of course she was not allowed in. When I went into the emergency room, it was really, I hate to say, but eerie. Now I've been in the emergency room a lot of times as a police officer. Eight o'clock on a Wednesday night, the emergency room is crowded normally. There's people everywhere. I think I was one of four people there. Um, and it was just really strange. Went in and um, was admitted immediately. And within two hours, I had to test back that I was positive. Um, it was, I was put into a, a regular room on the COVID only floor. And so that was on Thursday or Wednesday into Thursday. And of course it's tough. My, cause I could only really text my wife, talked occasionally. Um, the Friday morning, I guess Thursday into Friday, about one o'clock I woke up and I had a team of doctors around me. Um, I was sleeping and they told me, and I guess the doctors can explain it better than, than I, but I was told to sleep on my belly, which I always do. Um, I woke up and that's when they told me I was being transferred to the ICU. They, they were really concerned that my oxygen level in my blood was dropping. Um, when I got to the ICU, they started to prepare me that I was probably gonna be put on a ventilator in the morning, if not earlier. Um, and I know it was tough on my wife because she got the same, she got a phone call from the doctor explaining to her that. And when you think back early on in the pandemic, you heard about people being put on ventilators, not coming off ventilators. So I knew that was tough. Um, and the first person my wife called was Jen. So it didn't just have, I mean, cause we are a big family here. Um, so I was very blessed that that Friday morning, I guess the easy way to put it is I stopped de-escalating or decompensating, however, whatever the term is. Um, and I did well, I was not put on a ventilator, um, but I still had a lot of issues. I had a ton of emotional issues that I've talked about before. Um, Jen and I teach mental health first aid. I teach a lot of mental health training and I knew that I was in depression. Um, the nurses were sensational and um, Allie, my nurse, was in constant contact with my wife. And at one point she told my wife, you know, he's going to be okay physically. He's doing well, but emotionally he's terrible. Um, and that's where the nursing staff was sensational. They worked with my, they talked to my wife about what to, what to do for me. Um, Allie made a, a card up, just a get well card for my family. 
She had my wife and daughters and son make a collage of pictures. Then my wife drove up to the hospital. Allie actually ran out in the parking lot, met my wife, took it back in and hung it on the wall. Um, and that was just some of the supports that I got that was sensational for me with my family. Um, I can say the police department was sensational. Captain Plitt was on the, and actually my wife, after she talked to um, Jen, she called Captain Plitt and she was in constant contact with him. He made sure my family was taken care of the entire time, which was really important. My family was in, um, lock, you can say it locked down, but quarantine. He made sure that we as a family were taken care of, that he had meals delivered, lunch and dinner every day while I was in the hospital all the way through Easter after I was out. Um, and those social supports are so important. They were important for me knowing that the family was taken care of. Um, because in my, in my family, my uh, sister was in the hospital at the same time for a, a non-COVID related illness um, up at Johns Hopkins. And at that same time, I knew the effect it had on my parents. It was really hard on them knowing that two of their children were in the hospital, they couldn't visit them and there was nothing they could do. And I'm sure some of that stress um, led to my father's death in June, which he, he died from non-COVID uh, reasons but I'm sure the stress from that added to or diminished his time um, with us. When I, um, I talked about, I exercised all the time. When I finally did get out of intensive care and was in a room back on the COVID floor, just getting out of bed the first time, I had to have nurses on both sides of me making sure I, did, I was strong enough to walk. And, you know, it's pretty tough when you go from exercising every day, um, taking care of yourself, thinking you're healthy, that you need two people to make sure you can take a couple steps just to get to the bathroom by yourself and the weakness that, that I had. Some of the positives, um, and, and I think Jen will laugh about it, when I finally was in a room that Saturday night by myself, I bring a salad every day to eat, eat at lunch and it's a huge salad that I graze on. So I took a picture of my salad and sent it to Jen. And she says she knows that I was okay at that point. Um, but I hate to say it, the hospital food was that first meal I had, it couldn't have been any better. It just was because I hadn't eaten in so long. Um, I remained in the hospital till Tuesday the 7th. Um, and again, just walking out, um, just feeling weak and not realizing how bad I was um, and people will tell me now that when I talk to them on the phone, they could hear it in my voice. I just never realized how sick I was at the time. I, um, I was off for another three weeks, um, but then gradually came back to, to I'm back at full duty now, which I'm really blessed the way the department, the county treated me in that time to allow me to recover. Um, I was able to start exercising a week after getting out of the hospital. Of course, I, it was a lot a slower exercise than my normal pace, but it took me four months to get a clear exit ray to get the pneumonia out of both my lungs, which I think is pretty significant that it took until my August x-ray to have the no longer had pneumonia that I had back in, started in March. Um, so, and again, like everyone else, it's just for people to recognize the severity of the illness um, and the effect it has and can have on people, and it is for real. We are so glad to have you back. And, Thank you. <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, I know that you have always been amazing at your work, and, and um, um, to see the, the vulnerability and the willingness to acknowledge the, the emotional um, impacts of this, it's um, so important. And to see that in a police officer is important too. Thank um, y'all are people. We got to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. What do you got to add to that, Jen? Uh, hopefully, Jen, you're going to share with us. This has been getting pretty, pretty intense for people, I think, um, for all of us. And, um, and I know that uh, you're a healer. So give us some advice on the healing side of things too. And, and the emotional healing side of things. 
um, and any services that are available for that. Yeah, um, so that's kind of a perfect segue, you know, um, first of all, you know, it was really tough to watch Steve go through that. Um, I think Brian can probably test this too, is it's tough as a first responder when you're always in the hospital to not be able to run in and help your partner to kind of be stuck outside and not be able to assist um, in any way um, other than communicating through text, which I have to say the nurses were awesome and holding the phone up, allowing people you know, to communicate as best we could with him to kind of give him the emotional support, which is what I wanna talk about. You know, Steve talked a lot about um, emotional support and what people go through during COVID. I wanna also kind of just talk a little bit about after that piece um, for both people who suffered COVID and have come out of it and for people who did not and their family members, because one of the concerns I'm hearing, which we get a lot at crisis response right now through the warm line, is family who didn't get to grieve appropriately, that didn't get to say goodbye the way we normally are, are used to doing it and the struggle that they feel being alone. And I think the biggest concern all of us clinicians have right now at crisis response is we're kind of heading back into that kind of lockdown feeling and what do we do to help each other? And so one of them is, um, you know, checking on one another, making sure people are okay um, is one piece of it. The second thing that I want to share is that there are a lot of resources out there um, for people who have lost loved ones. Um, one of them that we, you know, we, we use a lot is um, a Chesapeake Life Center. They have great people there who can work through grief and loss with family members, especially even children. Um, so that's one resource I kind of want to put out there. And you don't have to remember right now, you can call into the warm line. We can even get you hooked up with them and connect the dots for you if you need that, that piece of resource. Um, another thing that I just kind of want to share is that the warm line is 24 seven. Um, our phone number is 410-768-5522. Again, it's 410-768-5522. And the reason I put that out there is we've had a lot of people just calling because they're lonely. They're, they're struggling with isolation. They're not getting out as much, um, you know, wanting to talk to someone, um, figure out how to move through the holidays. I think um, oh, our warm line um, supervisor just did something on Facebook um, that I thought was really great um, with the health department. And one of the things she talked about was, you know, um, what can you do with kids during the holidays if we're not going to get together with family? You know, make sure we're, um, we can use FaceTime to be with family if we don't think it's safe to get together. Um, have kids decorate masks um, for the holidays that they're going to wear, you know, to show off their masks, those kinds of things that we can do. Um, but as we lead into the holiday seasons, um, we need to check on people who are alone, whether it's by phone, um, just to make sure they have what they need. Um, if you are concerned, you know, there are well checks that can be done on people. If you haven't seen someone, you're concerned about someone, that's another option. Um, and I just want to thank um, the county exec because he's put a lot of funding into helping people. Um, and we are here to help. We, he has provided crisis for the next couple months with some resources to help people get linked to mental health treatment. Um, you can call in and we can link you with a provider if you're suffering with some depression, um, whether it be from loss or just from other things like loss of a job. Um, you can call into the warm line. We'll help connect you with any resources that you need. Um, I want to touch just really quickly on kids and having an honest conversation with kids that are, are starting to get a little scared um, with the numbers going up. Um, and they've already suffered a lot at the end of the school year going to virtual learning. And then the hope when school year started of going from virtual learning back to school and now the reality of the numbers going up, you know, everybody's made the decision to stay virtual. Um, and one of the things I want to say is, um, if there is concern, people can call in. We have the blessing from um, the acting chief right now. He's given us several of the SROs, which are student resource officers from the school. And we are reaching out to students that we are concerned about or what families are saying, you know, they're not sure what to do. Or they're, they're, 
um, students are struggling, we're going out and doing well checks to make sure those students are okay, making sure they're getting online okay. We're working with the school system. Um, but I'm, I want to make sure that it's not just about checking on adults, that we're checking on our youth as well. Um, because we're heading into the winter season, probably going to be less activity um, and just making sure they're okay. So I just want you to know that the warm line can be used both for adults and for the youth and that we're lucky right now to have a lot of those resource Anne Arundel County officers who are in the schools working when schools are in session now are here at crisis response and they're checking on students in their jurisdiction and working, we're working hand in hand with students uh, services from the Anne Arundel County Public Schools on that piece. So um, just know we're here if you need anything. Thank you. So uh, again, that number is 410-768-5522. And uh, if people wanna call for help and they kind of wrap around services um, and they don't want it to be about mental health issues, um, you can still call that number. There's also um, what started out as our food hotline, but now is a lot more than that, um, which is 410-222-FOOD, uh, maybe even easier to remember. Uh, and, um, um, and those folks can connect, connect families to services as well. Um, so thank you for, thank you for the, uh, uh, that discussion about healing and, and some of the services that the county has. Um, so we have now with us, um, finally, uh, our last speakers are, are from our two hospitals. Um, first from Anne Arundel Medical Center, uh, Dr. Barry Meisenberg, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Good, thank you. Good, good. Um, and uh, um, talk to us about what you've been seeing in the hospitals and, and how you see all of this. Well, I will. Thank you for the invitation. And, you know, I came prepared with, with prepared remarks, but I'm sort of distracted and I want to comment a little bit uh, about what I've heard. Uh, so first I want to express my thanks to the families who have uh, spoken out tonight and to the, those who've been patient. And I think it's essential to do this because without this, then this is just watching numbers scroll by on the television or in the newspaper. You know, we can get fixated on the numbers of uh, infected or hospitalized or dead without realizing that behind every one of those numbers is a family uh, who loved that person, um, a person who was uh, useful at work, if not uh, stellar at work and important in the community, as we've uh, heard examples. So you can lose sight of that if you just look at the numbers. So thank you all for uh, doing that and County Exec for inviting them. Uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on if Mr. Uh, Eads is still on the call, uh, if, if you really appreciate what a gift, what a gift your dad gave you at the end of his life, and that is the gift of an advanced directive. He arranged for you, uh, he made it easier for you and your family to make this decision to draw a limit. And uh, he took the burden off your shoulders to some extent and took it on himself. And if we learn anything from this, event, I'd like the community to learn the value of these things, uh, the, the, the benefit that they can bring to families in this situation, and not just COVID, but any chronic or severe disease. So he was thinking about you right at the very end. And uh, Lieutenant, I'll, I want to say I'm sorry to hear about your dad. I believe you said he died, uh, but not of COVID. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Right, so it leads me to an issue that I wanted to bring up, and that is this thing that we call a mortality gap. So we all know that the number of people dying in our state and across the United States and across the world actually is much higher this year than before. But the, the, the size of the increase cannot all be explained by COVID. There's more people dying than just the ones we count with COVID. And that's possibly because people are not getting the care they need uh, because of fear of the health system uh, or just wanting to stay home or uh, perhaps lack of access. So I know that both systems have really struggled and strived to increase access to make sure people are getting the preventive care uh, they should get as part of our mission. You know, it's not just sick care. 
And I think it's a very important message for the public not to forego that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, stress and depression contributes to that mortality gap, but we also, uh, we don't want, you know, uh, people dying of unminded heart disease or, or advanced cancer for failure to get their cancer screening. So let's not have two uh, pandemics or three. And um, uh, then I, I did want to uh, say, as we were talking before we came on, how much we regret having to close the hospital to visitors. What a horrible uh, decision that has weighed on us from the very beginning. And yes, our nurses have picked up a lot of that slack with, with, with Zoom and FaceTime, but it's not the same. Uh, every culture has an end of life ritual and they all involve uh, the closeness of families and not to be able to do that is a um, just the worst, the worst outcome of all of this little virus that we're facing. So I do uh, then also want to note as, as the county executive that things are better in the hospitals and people should uh, feel um, a little hopeful that uh, we're more experienced, we're wiser, we have a handful of medications that have been proven to be a beneficial and some we now uh, are proven not to be. So there's less confusion about that. Uh, we're better stocked for PPE and for ventilators. And I think that uh, there will be less uh, chaos. Um, and we, we have a plan and we've been planning continuously uh, since the beginning, even, even as the cases eased off, we knew it would come back and we feel like we're ready. Um, and so I, I want people to feel confident uh, alongside their worry, of course. Uh, one of the um, things we've done at Anne Arundel is we've greatly expanded the use of uh, what I call advanced therapeutic or research medications, which have been developed at the NIH or by the pharma pharmacology industry uh, to combat this deadly lung inflammation that you've all heard so much about. So there's been a series of therapies that we've brought in now uh, to offer to our patients who are hospitalized and struggling to breathe. Um, it's part of a global effort. Uh, some, uh, I'm hoping that some of these will be winners and will help our patients. And, and speaking of research, I do wanna remind everyone who might be listening that we do have a program for outpatients who are either exposed to COVID or who are sick with COVID, but not so sick to be in a hospital. And that's through uh, the, our relationship with the Hopkins School of Public Health. It's a test of convalescent plasma in high, in high antibody concentration to see if we can either prevent the disease in the case of someone who's exposed or uh, prevent hospitalization in the case of someone who's already infected. So it's a study, I don't, I don't make any promises, but with over a hundred people a day in the county testing positive, we should be able to, uh, enroll uh, uh, people to participate in this work and help answer the question globally uh, because it is a global problem. And I hope that we can get some help from the county in letting people know about this uh, study. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that. And so finally, I wanted to use this public forum to express my appreciation uh, for the many, many employees of the county, for the employees of the health system and actually for the employees of the grocery stores who continue to do their job every day, uh, weighing their sense of duty uh, above their own personal fears. And believe me, we all have personal fears, including people in my industry. Um, and we have more fears than most because we've seen it so often up front. So this is actually one of the definitions of bravery uh, when you can put aside your fears and keep going. And uh, I would just uh, uh, point out that there's a famous line in uh, one of Shakespeare's plays, The Merchant of Venice. It's often quoted out of context, but I'll quote it in context for you. Uh, and you've heard it before. There's a hidden message in that play and it says that all that glisters is not gold. Commonly said all that glitters is not gold. So this pandemic has revealed to me the wisdom of that little proverb. And uh, indeed, all that glitters is not gold. Some of what glitters is people, uh, our people. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been one of the, the blessings of this pandemic is to see these, this gold shining through in the individuals that work 
uh, for us in the county and uh, in private industry to help us uh, survive. So thank you very much for your attention. I will second that. There have been a lot of glittering people um, in, in all across this county, uh, whether they work for the county or they don't, re just residents helping out, um, and certainly in our, our two hospital systems. And, and I have to say that um, um, this has brought our hospitals closer together with each other and with our health department and with me. We do regular calls um, with the leadership of both um, BWMC and Anne Arundel Medical Center, both. And, and um, um, it's, uh, we're lucky to have such great institutions in this county. So from Baltimore Washington Medical Center, we have Sarah Viola, or is it Viola? But, okay, and um, you're still muted, Sarah. Um, lead physician on the COVID-19 recovery program uh, at BWMC. So uh, tell, tell, us, tell us what you're seeing. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, this invitation and thank you so much to the other panelists. Um, I think it's wonderful that we're doing this. Um, I wanted to start by saying that tonight I really represent a team of frontline healthcare workers um, who are really the hardest working, most compassionate people I've ever been privileged to work with. Um, our critical care team at BWMC has now treated over 300 patients who developed critical illness due to COVID-19. So those are patients who required care in an ICU, in our ICU. And I want everyone out there to know that we are ready and we are prepared to provide the highest quality of care that we can provide to anyone who gets sick with this virus in this next upcoming wave. Um, you know, critical care is not just a job for any of us. Uh, if it was just a job, I don't think many of us could keep going through it, but it really is truly a calling, as cheesy as that might sound. But that's why we're ready to face this challenge because it's really our passion um, to help patients through such a crisis. Um, but just as much as we're prepared and ready to fight this battle, we need the community to do their part. Um, I like to make an analogy between uh, nurse patient ratios and doctor patient ratios versus teacher student ratios because I think that's something everyone can understand. You know, a teacher who has to teach a group of 70 children simply cannot provide the same standard of education to those children as they could provide to 20 children. And I think that's obvious to everyone. The same is true for critical illness, of course, with much smaller ratios. Our patients are extremely vulnerable. They are entirely dependent on care every moment when they're critically ill. And the only way that we can make sure that we provide the best, highest quality standard of care for these patients is if our staffing can keep up with the number of patients that come through our door and need ICU level of care. And I think there's a lot of talk about, will we have enough ventilators? Will we have enough doses of medications? And those are important questions. And I'm glad that people have been asking those questions all along because it did get us prepared um, with those pieces of infrastructure, but we simply cannot create more critical care nurses, more physicians, more respiratory therapists out of thin air. And so that's why we need the community to do their part to flatten the curve. And uh, we need pay people to make self-sacrifice to make sure that we can continue to save lives. Um, Part of the mission here at BWMC and across the country in terms of uh, modern critical care also is providing care that uh, transitions patients out of critical illness and back into their community when they're fortunate to survive critical illness. And so in light of that, in October, we launched our COVID-19 survivorship clinic. Um, so that's a clinic that we've developed uh, that is intended primarily for patients who have survived critical illness related to COVID-19. So primarily patients who needed high amounts of respiratory support, who needed an ICU level of care. We know those patients are the most vulnerable when they um, are fortunate to survive and transition out of the ICU and ultimately out of the hospital. Um, I think there may be a misperception out there that you survive critical illness, you get off the ventilator and you're back to your normal life. 
and anyone who's been through it knows that's simply not the case. Um, often our patients spend weeks on the ventilator um, and much of that time they're deeply sedated and are immobilized. Um, and as you heard earlier, there aren't just physical challenges with that, but there's emotional and mental health challenges. And some of these physical and mental health challenges can last for months, if not a lifetime afterwards. So one of the things that pains me when I watch the news and I see the numbers go up and up and up is, of course, you know, we all mourn the deaths and the losses um, of the people that we couldn't save. Um, but I also think about the many, many more patients beyond that 200,000 some statistic that we see continue to climb. For every one of those deaths, there are many, many more who are forever altered, even though they've survived the illness. Um, and that includes people who never needed the hospital, but especially those who needed ICU level of care, who are potentially far weaker, some unable to go back to work, some with symptoms of post-traumatic stress from essentially going through a near-death experience. Um, so we're trying to provide a service to those folks and, um, and it's a relatively new initiative. Our survivorship clinic uh, just started in October, as I mentioned. We're learning a lot um, from our patients and I'm doing my best to try to serve their needs um, along the way. Um, I just uh, wanna second uh, the remarks uh, from others about how grateful I am that family members of, um, of our patients are here tonight and, um, and some of our uh, survivors of COVID-19 are here tonight to share their personal stories. Um, it would be very easy for you to want to just maintain your privacy um, and, and not you know, be a part of this, but I think it's so important that people understand that these are real people and for me every day, uh, meeting new people that I'm bringing into the ICU, um, some of them um, you know, putting on life support, holding their hand to try to explain to them what's going on, um, seeing them try to struggle uh, to communicate with me while, while a breathing tube is still in. Um, this, this is my every day is you know, trying to care for these people um, as, as whole human beings. And I wish so much that the general public um, would also understand that each one of these people that we have lost and each person that is fortunate to survive is a real whole human being. Um, and I care deeply about every single one of them. And I know everyone on this call does too. And I just hope that um, people who have been fortunate enough to not be touched yet by this virus understand um, just how important it is to realize that these are not just numbers. Thank you, uh, Dr. Viola. Um, that was our last uh, speaker. And um, uh, I just wanna say how um, important what we just did was. Uh, this has been, I know the most important of these um, weekly um, virtual town hall like things uh, that we've done. And it's, you know, it's been streamed on Facebook. It's been put out on our, our you know, county um, cable television station, but it will also be, um, we'll have a link on YouTube and we will be distributing this out far and wide. Um, and we understand that, that we not only have to create some restrictions uh, that, that are frustrating for people, um, particularly businesses, but we're at a point now where we really have to change my hearts and minds and change behavior and and what you have just done um, the stories that you have just told are um, going to be an important part of that so we may also be cutting some of this up and using it in other things with your permission um, because um, that's that's another phase of this um, we've actually engaged with uh, the county's engaged with some some really good marketing folks um, to to do that hard work of, of telling the stories, changing the minds and, and um, pleading with people to um, treat this virus with the respect um, that it deserves and finish the job that we started so that we can uh, push these numbers down and, and um, protect and save lives and protect people um, until we have a vaccine that has been distributed far and wide 
and um, and really uh, move us to to the stage where we can get back to a more normal life. So thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of you. Um, we love you. We all love each other, and we have to remember that. And we have a lot of work to do to protect each other. So thank you very much.